Hello, I'm Jason DeRosso, presenter of the Screen Show at ABC Radio National, and it is my absolute pleasure to be hosting this panel on behalf of uh, the Melbourne International Film Festival. The panel is called uh, Family Affair, Filmmakers Share Their Lives. And before I begin, uh, the Melbourne International Film Festival um, does acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live learn and work and pays uh, respect to uh, the elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And I'd like to pay my particular respects uh, to country and tell you that I'm here on uh, land of the Gadigal people of the Eurora Nation. Uh, and I'll begin, uh, first of all, by introducing the filmmakers on this panel. Uh, we have um, Celeste Bell, who is co-director of Polystyrene, I Am a Cliché, which chronicles the legacy of her punk icon mother and uh, lead singer of British punk band X-Ray Specs. Uh, Tariki Onus is co-director of A Blaze, which is a MIF premiere fund supported film, uh, a documentary that unearths the remarkable history of Aboriginal activism and culture in the middle of the 20th century, a journey that begins via the discovery of a long lost film shot by his grandfather, Bill, who was uh, many things, but amongst them an Aboriginal activist, impresario, performer and entrepreneur. And uh, also on the panel, we've got Christine Hamburg, who's co-director of a film called He's My Brother, which is uh, about her brother, Peter, who's one of only three people in Scandinavia, uh, born without the ability to see or hear. And the film is about the evolving challenges that her family face uh, to care for him. So um, welcome to all of you. Tariki, maybe we could start with you. Your grandfather, as I mentioned, there was, was this amazing figure, this community leader and uh, an activist um, and also a filmmaker. How much did you know about him before you began the film? I knew a tremendous amount about my grandfather before I began the film. However, most of it had existed within, if you will, family mythologies, sharing stories of the great deeds that our family members had, had been engaged with. And certainly I knew that there was extensive records of what Bill, my grandfather, had done, but I'd never really engaged with them. And it wasn't until a very dear friend and colleague, and now my co-director on this film, Alec Morgan, got in contact to say that he'd found a film of Bill's in the National Film and Sound Archive in Canberra, that all of a sudden I was opened up to this whole other aspect of Bill's life. I knew he'd made films, but I believed they'd all been lost in a fire in the 1950s. And to find extant pieces of his work still out there in community and to be given the opportunity to see the world through his eyes, through a whole different medium, was was really quite extraordinary and was an amazing journey to have the privilege to go on with with great friends and and makers along the way celeste your mother was you know very well known um was a really iconic figure in british music and popular music but an iconic figure in in so many ways her life resonated with so many people and i think that's what your film you know articulates so well there's so many issues here that you're implicated in. I mean, this is a family story. There are very many personal issues here about being someone's daughter, issues about race. How much courage did you have to muster to tell this story? Was it, was it, was it daunting? It's, um, it's been a real pleasure, to be honest, and um, a privilege to be able to, you know, have the opportunity to to delve into you know my mother's history and my family history and have people be interested in it so i i just think it's um it's it's been a real honor and and generally a very um rewarding and enriching experience so i just feel very grateful and this is a question really to all of you in a sense but celeste i'll you know i'll ask you first was there a sense of you being concerned about whether you do the story justice? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, you have to, my mother's, you know, no longer with us. So, um, 
you know, I, I definitely always had in mind that I wanted to make a film that she would be, she would be proud of, she would be happy with, but, you know, without being able to, to communicate with her, um, that's, you know, it's, it's definitely a real, a sense of responsibility, um, to make sure that I, you know, I do the story justice and also respect her wishes, um, even if she's no longer with us and but at the same time you know being honest and truthful and and telling my story as well so it was that was a real balance and a great yeah a great responsibility christine with your film about your brother i mean this is a very particular sort of situation with its own set of um challenges i imagine especially when it comes to issues of consent because this is your brother's a guy who who um you know, uh, can't see, can't hear. And as the film progresses, he becomes increasingly withdrawn. And this is a stage he's going through or a phase he's entering, which is triggering a sort of crisis for you all, for you all, you and your parents um, and other people who care for him. Tell, can you talk to me about your own sense of consent in this film, even when it comes to your brother and how how you decided this was a film that he wanted to make as well with you well um of course uh we all want the best for peter and i think um if he were able to tell us what he thinks he would um he would tell us to make this film because it's also uh for his own benefits that we're making it um hopefully it will make some changes in his life um but also i mean um, my mother is the guardian of uh, peter so i mean she wouldn't um decide that that it wasn't a good idea if it, she didn't think so um but yeah definitely that has been uh, an ongoing thought uh, in both me and the, the director, Celia Hennebelt's um, mind. Um, but he has also always been really fond of us being there filming and, um, you know, that has been a whole activity day for him um, when we have been doing that. So, yeah, it's just been, I think he's been really, really happy when we've been there and filming. Because all of you in a way are, are dealing with people or subjects who to a degree are absent and and i know you're all very i mean you can tell from the films you're all very much invested in getting this story right and doing justice to these lives um in the case of um you know in, in the case of you christine obviously your, your brother's very much present in the film but but in some ways you know he he's absent because of the the challenges he has um so maybe to um uh, to ricky i could ask you about just that I, that that level of expectation and and needing to get that history right because your your story in particular is really sprawling isn't it i mean it deals with so much history that really hasn't been talked about a lot it does it deals with so much history and one of the hardest parts about for me i think about devising this story and and when uh, Alec, my my collaborator, and I were working so heavily on on this, talking about the script. the the biggest The biggest challenge is working out what to leave out, because there's so much story that that gets left out. But for someone like me, as well, telling a story of of my grandfather, this question, as you say, of doing the story justice, always comes back again and again. My grandfather Bill was very much and remains very much public property if you will, within Aboriginal communities around the southeast of Australia. And I love that. But at the same time, it's a fraught proposition when you're out there engaging with community old aunties and uncles in the in the community who, who, who tell you how much you look like your grandfather and at the same time exactly what your grandfather would have thought about X, Y or Z. And trying to trying to channel that person and think, well, am I? Am I representing their voice in an accurate light? Because I have to engage in, certain, in a certain measure of 
of supposition at times when it comes to their motives. And how do I carry that that forwards? What what can I live with and 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 where is their voice? I think is a question that came to me a lot in this process. Yeah, Celeste, can you relate to that? I mean, your because your film is partly it's it's a rock documentary, but it's so much more than that. It's as I sort of mentioned already, it's the history of you and your mum, your relationship, which at times becomes quite fraught. There are moments where your mum faces um, some pretty serious mental health issues that you recount that I imagine might have been difficult to tell or perhaps difficult to work out how to re relay. I don't know. You tell me, though. Yeah, it's uh, definitely challenging. Um, I think in terms of, I think uh, Tiriki made a good point about the voice and um you know, I was really wanted to make sure that my mother's voice was present throughout the film. Um, so, because, you know, you can't really tell the life or recount the life of a person, I think, through one, one just one perspective. So my perspective, mm. um, you know, I wanted my mother's voice to, to be constant. So she's telling her story while I'm reflecting on her story and then also reflecting on my story and then we had other people who we interviewed who can also sort of uh, fill in all the all the gaps that exist let's say so you have a, a well-rounded kind of idea of who this person was who my mother was but she was so many different people and that's why it's really important to have as many voices as we could uh, but her voice being Signet, you know, being um, constant throughout, um, and and I think that's the only way that you can deal with some of these more tricky subjects as well, because um, you know, when you look back at what happened, you know, in your life or what happened in in her life, um, without having all of these different perspectives, you can end up with something very um, well, very narrow and. Um, I didn't want to end up in a kind of, um, you know, like any sort of sob story, you know, because that's not, even if there were difficult moments, you know, challenging moments that I went through, it's not, a, the, the purpose of this was not some kind of therapy, even though there is something therapeutic <laughs> about the process, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it was really, yeah, really challenging to, to be open, to be truthful, um and to be respectful and then but i think the best way to to achieve that is by having yeah all of these different voices and and having my mother's voice constant throughout i even feel that there's a moment in the film where um the saxophonist the original saxophonist in x-ray specs who also becomes a Hari krishna at one point i think you and her have a slightly divergent view maybe i'm wrong but on the Hare Krishna episode of because she's really quite uh, even after you, her and your mum sort of fell out professionally or musically they come back together and she's still very much clearly um, a believer in that worldview and 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 I don't want to give too much away in the film but you're perhaps a little bit more um, ambivalent um, and I, I thought that was interesting like the film could cope with these two views these two very different these two different philosophical views around your mother and what she would have wanted and and how her life progressed yes definitely and i think you know it's difficult we could have i think we because we also wrote a book before the film and so the film um sort of has a lot of elements of the book in it um in terms of the interviews but in the book we were able to put many many more interviews so you had even more like con conflicting and contradictory accounts um but i think those that is really important because you know again a life doesn't fit in a neat narrative um and as a filmmaker you know the ten the the temptation is to try and make you know what is history, what is personal history fit into 
a narrative that can actually also be uh, entertaining in a sense. That's and uh, and with you know, and then I think truth is lost um, sometimes in that in that process. So having these like contradictory accounts is really really important because that is life. Life is messy, and everyone has their own perspective on what uh, what happens or what happened. Um, you know, so it's very, very much this uh, this idea of truth, um, whose truth, um, you know, I think was was really interesting, interesting for me. Christine, I want to ask you a question about your film, um, He's My Brother, because unlike these the other two films, um, Ablaze and Polystyrene, I'm a cliche, you are in this film in a way that 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 finds you more implicated in the story perhaps uh, and in the story that's unfolding currently. So in other words, you're finding yourself um, seeing your parents growing older, finding it harder and harder to look after your brother, Peter, because just physically he's a big guy, they're getting older, all of that. And you're realizing that eventually that responsibility to look after your brother will, will perhaps come to you especially given the public services that have usually, you know, have worked in the past to sort of help care for him, have been defunded, um, centres have closed down and so forth. So this is a big concern of yours. And I was struck by how much your film articulates that concern in a way that's, um, there's an absence of vanity, let's put it that way. I mean, were you, were you, how difficult was that to portray? Because I imagine some audiences may very well think for a moment at least. I mean, I don't think this is the overall impression, but for a moment, wow, she's being selfish or she's, or were you afraid of those sorts of reactions, you know? Yes, of course, um, still. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, um, yes, I'm afraid of that, but it's also, um, well, I, I guess I hopefully I, I, I'm thinking what you're thinking, but I have to, you know, live my own life and um, have my own kids someday and my own um, my own hu husband and like and Peter has to fit into that picture. But I can't just you know set my life on pause when my parents aren't here anymore because he needs that help. Um, and I think that should be a system that where it could be more of like an equal part where they can help and i can help um but right now there's not i mean we are taking care of peter 24 7 and i'm the only one uh, except my parents who can help him um so and we're not getting any help still um we finished shooting yeah a year ago and still nothing has happened um so yeah i don't know if i answered your question correctly no that's absolutely fine i think you have and i'm and i'm wondering as well what, what was the genesis of the film for you what what was the inspiration to make this film was it that you wanted to make it you wanted to illustrate this issue more broadly whereby there are the services that used to you know, exist to help care for people like Peter and in Peter's condition have been closed and economic rationalism, let's say, has 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 had its effect. It was was that a motivating factor? I mean, it all started with me just I, I got my uh, dad's camera when I was 10 and I just started filming his him and his world and because I thought he was really fascinating you know he can't see he can't hear what does he experience like what does he smell what does he dream you know what what is his world like he doesn't know anything except his own little bubble um so that was kind of the start and um and then uh when we got older you know we started uh seeing the i mean we, uh, peter he lost his um his uh, daycare uh not daycare what what's it's called like the the place well, day, where he daycare. Yeah. yeah daycare yeah, yeah. Um, daycare works and, yeah. yeah 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 good <laughs> um and 
uh, we started just seeing this system fall apart and his life just falling apart because he couldn't go to where he was every day. He couldn't go horseback riding or he couldn't do anything. And that might, might si sound privileged uh, to do, but I mean, that was all he knew. He knew nothing about what was a world like we just um, experienced with Corona. He, if that was his world for like, I mean, five, six, seven years now. Um, he's uh, and he got really depressed, and that so that was kind of the okay. That there's more to this story than just you know his world, and so I contacted um, Silly Hannibal, who's directing, and uh, she was like. Yeah, we need to make a film, <laughs> basically. Yeah, but uh, yeah. but yeah, there was a did, factor. Did it start? Yeah. Did, it, did it start as a kind of cinema verite exercise where it was, it was the director coming out and and filming you and your mom and you know the family dealing with your brother on a day to day basis? Was that the was that the the first thread of the film? Yeah, I guess so. It was. Yes. We, well. We were filming together, so um, I was filming something, and Celia was filming something, and uh, I don't think you can say that that was the only way we did it and how we started it. Um, but um, yeah, we basically just were together all the time and and filming. Yeah, um, but I also, you know, I, there's a lot of footage from when my uh, when we were kids, my parents uh, filmed. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of footage to think about how to mix those, um, yeah, with those scenes Actually, together. All, yeah, all three films, and this is common about. I mean, this is this is a panel whose title is Family Affair, right? So filmmakers sharing their lives, and and in this these kinds of films, um, there's often this common thread of you know shots of family photo albums, but certainly archival footage, whether that's home movies or in, or in the case of your um, grandfather, Tariki, a film. I mean, he was involved in the Australian film industry in the first wave, not the second wave, but, you know, he worked with people like Charles Chevelle and, you know, so he's quite a figure. Mm -hmm. um, but you have this amazing professionally made film as well as sort of newsreel footage and so forth. But just throwing a question out to, to you and Celeste as well um, about archival footage. Um, and the challenges of working with archival. Um, who'd like to begin? Anyone ha does anyone have any thoughts about how they used archival in their film? Celeste, maybe the film begins on archival footage, actually, doesn't it? Of a row of um, TV sets in a looks like a 1970s shop window with your mum on top of the pops or something, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. So that was behind the scenes that um, it, there was a German TV show. It was like a German version of Top of the Pops, which is a UK, um, was a UK pop program where bands would go on and perform their, um, their, their hit singles. Um, so this was a, a German TV show. My, my mother performed with her band and uh, her manager was a filmmaker. So he took a lot of behind the scenes footage, um, you know, with this old um, camera. Um, so you have this wonderful 7-8 footage from, from the manager. So we were able to, to access this amazing footage, but it wasn't, there wasn't very much of it. There was only about maybe 20 minutes worth of, of footage um, of this unseen footage. So a lot of the process of making the film, and it was really challenging. It was, you know, probably the most challenging thing about actually putting the film together was sourcing um, and financing, um, because it's a big expense, um, footage of my mother's band at the time, and also of, you know, historical footage of, you know, the places that we visit in the film. So, you know, historical footage of London, of, of uh, New York, um, Somalia, like lots of footage of um, people and places. And, um, and then of course, performances of, 
that my mum's band did on on TV programs and interviews and things like that. So it was a you know the film is about fifty percent original um, footage, um, archive footage. So it was uh, really really challenging to to finance this, um, and so it, it's one of the reasons why the film took so long to finish. We we started in twenty sixteen, um, and it took us a good three years, I would say, just to to get to a stage where we we had all the the footage that we we needed, um, that we'd secured it, we'd sourced it, and we'd secured it, and um, we we're in a position to to pay for it. Um, but actually, using the footage and working with the footage was, you know, it was wonderful. Um, I studied history actually at university, and so. You know, I kind of came to this project also with it as a historian and, and having access to all this wonderful material, you know, footage, but also pho photographic material was just was wonderful. Um, and you can be so creative with with archive. Um, you can do so many things. So, yeah, but a big challenge. Um, I would not take on um, such a, a footage heavy project um, lightly. I was going to say one of the interviews that stands out is um, is the interview that um, your mother did with X-ray Specs must have toured Australia or maybe it was um, recorded in the UK. But our you know big rock critic broadcaster of the 20th century certainly he was I mean he's still alive. He's such he was such a legend on TV screens. Molly Meldrum. So there's an Australian voice that keeps recurring <laughs> and it seems to be quite a significant interview because you go back to different bits of it. And your mother looks amazing in it. Yeah. She has her braces on her teeth and she looks like a girl. You know, she's so young. It's probably that it was it's probably the most significant piece of footage, actually, that we that we found, mainly because it's um it's quite a long interview. Um, and the camera is always on my mother and it's quite close up. So you it's it's quite wonderful because you you hear um you know the interviewer's voice but you don't see him you just see my mother so you're catching all of those um all the expressions you know um when she's thinking about how to answer a question um and it, she's very she's very young this is right at the start of x-ray specs and she's not you know she's not been through that mill yet you know of um the entertainment mill where you have to kind of be you know like there's a level of artifice isn't there um, and she's not, she's not in, she hasn't been in that world long enough. So it's very natural. Her and her reactions are very natural. You know, she's just like, ah, what, what, <laughs> what, how am I supposed to answer this question? So I really love that footage. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, we, you know, we secured that from ABC. Um, and, and, and yeah, we were just, were so happy that we were able to use it um, in its entirety. I mean, you don't see it all in the, in the film, but it's it, a great piece of footage. Tariki, your film is is full of the most amazing archival material, and you know some of it's you know from all staff, some of it seems to be newsreel footage. Um, but tell me about accumulating and amassing all of that. I mean, that must it, it looks like it was uh, a huge mammoth task. It was a mammoth task, and one which in many ways i suppose we were fortunate that it took us so long to actually get this film made you know, alec morgan and i met about seven years ago to discuss making this film and started on it quite quickly but it has really taken all of that time to amass the type of material that you see we have been pulling it together and and frequently in that time, the new pieces will be found, new stories will come to life. It's been an extraordinary journey to go on, but one that I've been incredibly grateful for. Knowing that my grandfather made films and thinking that they were all lost was one thing, but to be able to go back, find his voice, find pieces of his story, and to continue piecing that narrative together, I thought to myself, what else is sitting there in the archive, especially for us here as 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia who are engaged in a process of reclaiming our cultural practice, regaining our history and us regaining our history and our story, and then rematriating that, repatriating that back to country. What else is there in the archive? Because if it weren't for the privilege that I enjoy and the space in my life to be able to do this sort of work, these films wouldn't have come to life. And in a weird, perverse way, were it not for ASIO, our intelligence organisation, having kept my grandfather and his contemporaries under such close and tight surveillance throughout their lives, we wouldn't have the types of records that we have now. And the irony is not lost on me that those very same people who were monitoring and trying to suppress my grandfather and his contemporaries are now those same people who have given us the means to be able to bring their stories to light in some aspect. But the ability to see ourselves through our own eyes is such an extraordinary strength. The ability to have the voice of those old people. In many ways, the archive is a whole character in and of itself in this film for me. It embodies so many of those people who, at a time when they were largely considered voiceless, embraced emergent technologies in the most extraordinary way to bring their stories to the world. I want to ask all of you, just put a question out to the panel um, about the emotions of, of telling these stories in these films. They're all films that obviously, you know, recount very intimate details of your lives and the lives of people you love in your family. Um, did you find that you needed to sort of put a lid on emotions sometimes when you were making these films? Um, and were there other times when, you know, making these films made you cry or, or made you really emotional? Well, these are all being terribly polite, but <laughs> I'll dive in if I may and say absolutely. I mean, Hugely so. I, I never knew my grandfather. He died 12 years before I was born. And the opportunity to, to walk with him and others has, has been extraordinary. It's, it's a fraught process, I think. It's one that is incredibly heavy for me to navigate these spaces and to try to come to terms with the sort of world that Bill, my grandfather and others were living in. It's quite humbling in many ways to see the work that we do now and the, and the tremendous privileges I enjoy and the things that perhaps I might consider as being hard or tough compared to what those who've gone before me have had to deal with, compared to what it's like to make inroads there and it is it's it's emotional even doing these types of panel discussions and interviews it's it's not an easy place to sit in sometimes i think i often wonder if if i have the right to speak for people not having necessarily lived that life but at the same time i feel i have the responsibility and the obligation to see that those stories come to the world as well Celeste or Chris, Celeste, what were some of the emotions you felt? I mean, I know you go really right back to your grandparents and Africa, um, where part of your heritage lies, and there are really quite emotional, I think, stories of hardship there that you accompany with some wonderful archival footage. Um, tell me, tell me about the emotions that are stirred up in you as your. I mean, because obviously, as a filmmaker, you're also needing to, to a certain degree, be objective and work out mm -hmm. what's working and what's not. And maybe sometimes that's the, that's the opposite of what you're feeling uh, or what you, what you personally get out of the footage. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm very good at controlling my emotions. And I think the, the filmmaking process um, ha is, is also, you can't really be too emotional. Um, you know, 
it, you have to separate yourself a little bit. You have to create some distance between yourself and and uh, and the subject, and that's especially um, important when you know I'm the co-director, but I'm also the subject of the film. So that's you know the sub the subject of the film is obviously my mother, but I'm sort of very much a, a parallel or secondary subject. So that's really, really, really tricky. And if if um, if you don't have some distance there, and you don't have some objectivity, I think it would be impossible to do it. So um, I think, yeah, it's you have to be able to control your emotions to to an extent, but at the same time, you want some um, emotion emotion to come through um, because that is also it, well, it's inevitable, you know, unless you're made of ice. Um, but also, it's that is what is going to resonate with the audience because um, we're dealing with universal themes that everyone can relate to. Um, so, like everything, yes, yeah, it's, it's a balance. But I, I do think um, objectivity and distance, distance in yourself um, when you are sort of the filmmaker, is really important. I mean, do, if Christine, I mean, I'm thinking of your um, documentary, which is, I mean, there are some moments there that are really quite troubling to watch because your brother is clearly, um, on the one hand, withdrawing into himself, but also lashing out and being quite physical. Um, were there moments where, I mean, and this is a question for all of you really, but were there moments where you feared you were being exploited and that you needed to think around how to depict certain moments which were very raw. Yes. Well, I was crying in the film <laughs> several times, um, but um, but I think it's it had to do with the fact that I was now I'm co-directing the film and I'm also in the film and you know I, I feel like I have a, a lot of roles in like um, in making this film. And I think that was probably the hardest part to navigate through the, throughout those um, different roles. Um, you know, being in the film and then having to co-direct at the same time and being a sister to my brother and helping him and also being a daughter to my parents um, um, and trying to figure out just to have a normal life. Um, but I think the hardest part was really just, you know, being in that situation and then not being able to do anything at all, like not helping him in, in, a, in a sense, even though I'm helping him every day with his everyday life, but I'm not able to do anything in that situation. I can't, I, I cannot, it's not, in, it's out of my hands. Um, Are you so saying that, because that, at that point you were the filmmaker, mm -hmm. is that what you mean? Like in certain moments where he was becoming agitated um you were uh, that point yeah, yeah, the camera that, yeah that too definitely um i was just talking about the um, the whole system thing and not being able to to uh, give him that place that he has the right to have um, um oh, yes the, the state-run care mm -hmm. you're, you're referring to yeah exactly. uh but yeah definitely the um, also just f filming him being um aggressive uh was a very like uh hard thing for both of us both me and C and Sila the director because you know um how how is that okay to to show the world and um of course we've you know been filming a lot of those situations and just picked out the the ones that you know where we feel like that would be okay to show because uh, that's just like <laughs> the what the situations in the film is very actually very low to what it usually is um also so, just so you, you know, talk about yeah so you but, didn't you didn't include you, you didn't include some footage that you thought was either too extreme yeah, or, or... Yeah. definitely or just you know because of you know what we talked about earlier uh, about ethics how to um is it okay to show a person who doesn't know he's been uh he's been filming um he's been uh been filmed um that he's so so aggressive and so uh 
um, yeah, so yeah, <laughs> we, we took out some of those uh, parts that were very heavy and that wasn't, um, yeah, but de definitely I thought that was emotionally just really hard to film, but also to that there's a film out there now where he is like that because yeah, that, that, that's hard to, yeah. It's interesting that you've all made these films with co-directors and I'm wondering if mm -hmm. we can compare notes on, on the relationship you had with your various, your, your co-directors. I mean, perhaps it was a similar relationship in, in all three cases. Um, but, um, you know, what does a co-director help you do in this situation or how did they help you as, as, as filmmakers, but also as subjects of your own documentaries about your families? Um, Celeste, maybe we could start with you. What, what was that relationship with your co-director like? How important was it? I mean, it was very important. Um, I think for me, not coming from a filmmaking background, um, what Paul brought to, to the project was experience. So he had um, a little bit more experience than me, made two films um, already. So that was, you know, the most important, I think, contribution um, was, was the experience that he could bring. Um, but then also it does help, I think, with objectivity, again, um, you know, to have that person who is really removed from the story. Um, and I think it's great to have this relationship, um, well, to have that the, the co-director, when you're dealing with a very personal story when it involves your own family members. I think it's great to have, you know, both perspectives. So it's really great that you have, um, I think in all of our projects, all of our films, we are, um, we are still kind of, um, we have some control over the narrative of our own personal history and our family history. I think that's really important. Um, but on the other hand, you have, um, an outside uh, perspective and uh, that enables you to um, well it enables the film I think to um, to have some more balance there and again it just aids in terms of, of distance um, so I think it's really it's it's really great because of, I feel like often doc documentary films when they're it's you know a more traditional setup so you have a director who is, um, you know, let's say if it's a biography, um, you know, the director will, will research and, and will try their best to, to bring sort of, um, you know, to, to make a truthful and factual film. But there's only so much they're ever going to know or discover or find out. And I think the family members or partners or friends of the subject are really in the best place um, to tell the story, um, but it does. But they're so close to the story that can also, um, you know, be be challenging. So the the two having the co-director and uh, the director who is really involved in the story, I think it's just it's a great balance. Tariki, I know that there's a there's a fraught relationship though, isn't there, with indigenous stories and how they're told and how they've been told in the past and who gets to tell them and so forth. So, I mean, I, I'm mm. I'm not aware whether your co-director was indigenous also or, um, but no, no, Alec, Alec, Alec is a Alec is a um, is a <laughs> how, how, how does one quantify him? Uh, Alec is, is, is a wonderful militant white person who's had a long history of trying to amplify the voice of Indigenous peoples and is, is very passionate uh, in this space. And, and realistically, I, I wouldn't have made this film with someone else, I don't think, had I not already been aware of the work that Alec had done. And we've always, we've moved in similar circles, but never really connected up until, until we made a blaze together. Uh, he's now one of my um, one of my dearest and and firmest friends. I mean, we drive each other insane, but uh, I'd like to think we do that in a, in a reasonably productive kind of way. But it is fraught, and one of the biggest challenges I think that we had to overcome in making this film was to 
help other people to understand that my involvement was not a tokenistic one. That I was, you know, I was making this film, that Alec and I were making this film together along with extraordinary collaborators, many of whom are non-Indigenous. And I think for me, one of the strongest aspects of this whole process has been to acknowledge the voice and the commitment of non-Indigenous people to make films in a space that is so challenging like this. And indeed, as, as we go through the story of Ablaze, it is, and my grandfather's life is replete with stories of non-Aboriginal people who have decided that they can't stand the world being the way that it is and that they want to do something about it. And that has been a continual part of this process, but it has been challenging. I think for a lot of people, they are weighed down by low expectations at times. And when they come to approach a film, certainly one about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander subject matter, and they see an Indigenous co-director, they wonder if the uh, real director, in inverted commas, is engaged in, in some form of tokenism or trying to check boxes to, uh, to get this piece made and through. It's, it's a long journey. What I'm very grateful for is the camaraderie of the other filmmakers with whom I've worked, not just Alec, but all of our, our creative team, to be able to realise this story and the excitement that they have had in creating a space for themselves to take some ownership as well. I completely agree with uh, the points that you were making, Celeste. It's, it's wonderful to have someone with some objectivity who can step outside sometimes. If, if I put everything into this film that I wanted to put into it, it would be nine hours long and uh, I'd, I'd still be <laughs> agonising over what gets left out. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the thing, having someone be able to, to step back and all, but also someone you have a relationship with where you can say, no, that's, I'm drawing the line here because that's, that's important and, and let me tell you why. So it's, it's an interesting experience, but one I think I've been very blessed with. I found, I found a collaborator with whom I have a great simpatico and well, to the extent that we haven't killed each other over the course of the last seven years, and we're talking about the next film we want to make together, I think are probably good signs that uh, that we actually get along relatively well, and we feel and we feel we can keep doing this stuff. But you're right; it's 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 a very interesting and uh, and challenging space to be in. I have to ask you, um, given the title of this panel, I'm really curious about what your families have thought about these films and maybe even family in the broader sense of the word. I mean, Celeste, you've probably got the punk family maybe and the feminist family and all these other sorts of families around that will have their, that will have their very strong opinions on how you've talked about their history, if you like. But maybe I'll start with you, Christine, because I mean, perhaps this is the, the rawest of the films in that if you quant qualify that by, um, or, or you quantify that in terms of it being a film it's taking place now and everyone's alive and you know and it's very much history being made um before our eyes this film of yours um so tell me about the reaction of your family to, to the finished product um well i think uh, luckily i have a have some really wonderful parents who are very proud um and they couldn't be happier with the results and i think that has also uh, to do with the fact that I've been filming since I was 10 years old and I'm 27. So they've been very used to me just filming everything in my life <laughs> and their lives and making them small birthday videos and stuff like they've been used to just seeing themselves on, on camera. And I think uh, that was actually a very big part of them like just showing them the film in the end because they were like they weren't, weren't like oh i look ugly or oh like i don't like myself in this scene or this scene um they have just been taking it all in and just being very i think they're very proud <laughs> um uh, that's the feeling that i'm getting um what about the broader it's also I don't, I don't... What about the broader sort of, I don't know if it, it's correct to term it the disability care community or, but that broader sector, 
because your film is really makes some you know serious and well founded accusations about the the way that the state has um, you know reneged on its responsibilities, its duty of care to people like your brother with who have serious disabilities. Yeah, definitely. I've just been really happy that this film has just been very, you know, in a uh, gone out to just being not just about Peter's handicap or uh, disability because his he is very unique, and um, you could think that how can people relate to this because he's yeah one out of three in the in Scandinavia, uh, but I've really been just just got so many messages and um just people who it, yeah saying that they can really relate to just the 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 story behind and the 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 our family struggles because that's if what's the film is is about how we we deal with being you know the next person or um the person next to to a person with a with a disability um, so I'm very, very pleased and very happy that, that people are feeling that way. I haven't heard any <laughs> bad things about, about that. So I'm very, um, very happy. Nothing about, from uh, the government. Also, are uh, any politicians, are any politicians saying anything? Have you had any reaction from the bureaucrats yeah, or politicians? I'm very surprised. Yeah. I don't think they uh, dare to, <laughs> if I have to be honest. Um, and, uh, but they should they should really start saying something <laughs> i would be very happy to hear something soon but um, but it's a really big community because we are a lot of people who are um affected and um we are a lot of people who have just know somebody who has a disability so and i think that's why it touches so many people which i'm really happy about but that's also a very big you know um uh, weight on the shoulders to to have to lift that and not be sure if i'm telling the story um and, and if people can relate but it it feels like it it's it's uh, it yeah it hopefully happened <laughs> it feels like that but um that was a very big uh, concern of ours if uh, yeah we we could reach everyone if that makes sense it's interesting out it's interesting how all of these family stories do have a, a very strong activist element and um celeste yeah i hinted at it before but there are just so many interest groups i, I reckon that would be so that have such would have such strong opinions about about what your film's about your mother the the lead singer of x-ray specs um but so so many other things i mean she is a lightning rod for feminism for race issues in the uk um and then as a mother and and alternative spiritual beliefs as well, which was a really big part of the story. Um, so, you know, people in the Hare Krishna community, I imagine, would would have ideas. So let's start with your family, though, and, you know, what they thought, and then move on to, I don't know, the, the, the other circles. I think we've been really lucky in the sense that I haven't really had any, um, you know, no one's been sort of upset, you know, like, about how they've been portrayed because i think um you know the film is it's such we you know it's um it's such a balancing act and i think we we tread lightly throughout you know and um you, it's it's delicate and um it's it's quite poetic in many ways so there's nothing where we're saying you know this person was like this or this person was like that and there's no you know there are no there are no um there's no like uh there are no bad people there are no bad things you know we try to make sure everything is really nuanced and so there's very little i think in the film that anyone can say oh i didn't like that you know that was too that was a bit too much or i didn't like how i came across what about you yourself? Um, really how, do you, how do you feel that you came across? Because, I mean, we haven't mentioned so far that you've made a big stylistic decision to sort of appear in the film in a very stylized way. You appear an, on a white backdrop um, mm -hmm. from memory and in other sort of, you know, vignettes. 
you walking along a pier and so forth, but, you know, flicking through the book that you published, which was the precursor to this film, but it's, it's quite a stylized mm -hmm. thing and you've got your own voiceover in it, which is a particular, I like it a lot. It's a particular, a very kind of resolutely non-professional voiceover. It's a sort of voiceover that <laughs> I like, it's real, it's authentic. It's the sort of thing that broadcasters like me can't do. Off, you know, it's really hard for us to do because we've been trained to talk like, you know, FM radio people, <laughs> you know, but, and it's terrible in a film like yours, but you've got that. So tell me all about how you formed that and created that persona of yourself on screen. And then what, you know, what you, what you thought about that self-representation. For us, it was really a trial and error process. We tried lots of different, you know, different ways to have me on screen initially actually i wasn't on screen at all so you would just hear my voice um i i don't particularly like the sound of my voice i think it's like there's a, a certain drone <laughs> to my voice throughout and it could be irritating to some people um, i think actually one one of the very few negative comments was about you know my voice and how it's just like droning on that's fine um i i think there is there's something to that but initially it was just my voice i disagree i disagree and, i like it <laughs> but and and but just hearing me and not seeing me it wasn't quite working um just because you know you don't see my mum either in the present day um, and so to not see anyone in the present day and just see uh, archive footage and, and locations, it was empty. So we, we, we decided we needed uh, to, that I needed to be in, in those spaces. Um, so that was our first sort of initial decision. I was going to, to appear in the film. Uh, that was the sort of the first change. Um, and then it was working quite well having me in various locations but again it can be a bit samey you know it's like me sort of wandering around looking uh, you know uh, <laughs> deep in thought you know that can be a bit too much if it's only that so we wanted to bring some other elements and um, I had the idea to try and incorporate the book into the film um, because the book was really the genesis of the whole project so um, and the book is really visual as well, and there are some really beautiful pictures. So again, with, with pictures, we wanted to, to use um, original photographs and, and uh, memorabilia. And we did that. So we shot, we, we took, um, we shot me in, in my flat, um, looking at taking out the archive and looking at photos. And that was really nice, but we wanted to, to do something else with those photos and not just have them very static on the screen. Um, so actually looking at photos in the book, um, that was an idea I came up with because it would be a little bit more um, dynamic, let's say. And so um, the, the studio shots of me um, in the, yeah, as you said, in the white background, flicking through the book, that's become, that was sort of the, the, the later sort of addition. Um, and I really, really like that. And it was stylized. I wanted to do something stylized, um, actually, because we use a lot of footage, um, from an arena documentary, um, that was made about my mum in the seventies, who is polystyrene. So a lot of the footage that you see of my mum in our film is actually from that documentary. And, um, that was quite stylized, you know, so you see shots of my mum, uh, riding a bicycle or, or flicking through a magazine um, but they weren't the director of that that film he wasn't trying to make it too natural you know or candid um, it was quite clear that they'd set up this scene and I quite I like that because you know I, I'm not too fond of um, the whole like trying to recreate but at the same time it's candid and it's natural, you know, because it's not always natural and it's and and there's nothing wrong with it being a little bit theatrical and um and I like that stylistic element. So yeah, we 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 did, you know, we we kind of had that idea that was going to be quite stylistic and um we could have even gone further, you know, if we had if we had a bigger budget, we could have gone further with that. I, um, I would have liked to have done more in that space. Um, the only thing we tried and we we, we discarded because it wasn't working is is having me um, speak to the camera directly. 
um, it was it was much better with the voiceover, with the VO, um, than actually seeing me speaking, mainly because I'm not good at, um, you know, there's too many like, uh, uh, um, 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 I'm not really good at saying everything I need to say in a coherent way, um, speaking to camera. It was so much easier for me to write down, you know, have time to write down my thoughts and edit and then, you know, do the VO um, and, and it, I think it comes across much better in that way. We should point out that Ruth Negger also, the actor, Ruth Negger, you know, quite a, quite a name, voices your mother's yeah. thoughts or writings, which is a great, was that a difficult thing to, to um, was, was, was she difficult to, to get on board? No, no, she, um, she was just, uh, I asked her if she, she would do it and she, she's a big fan of my mum. So she was, um, really, really happy to do that. And she was fantastic, you know, having, actually having a trained actor, um, to do the VO was, you know, it was wonderful just because she, um, well, she did it so well. And, uh, I don't think anyone else could have pulled off, you know, my mum's voice. Um, she's as, great as in she it. Did. But, but... Mm -hmm. It doesn't clash with your voiceover and your voiceover is all those things which i appreciate and think really work um but it's sort of you know the opposite end of professional but but here you know i mean obviously ruth negger is an actor unlike me who again yeah. i'd just sound like i'd sound like um you know overly polished plastic or something but ruth negger actually also has that authenticity but it's it comes from the place of a great actor um which i think is great and and you've got a lot of most of your interviews are off camera actually so it's got this archival oh, feel oh, yeah. to it. all of them right but so you being on on screen i think is a really interesting choice and it works and i've got to speak to i've, I've got to um, speak to uh, to ricky uh, about being on screen too but before i do i just want to ask one other thing celeste was it hard to write voiceover i mean did you go through many many drafts or Yes, many, many, <laughs> many, many drafts. Um, I really enjoy, you know, I, I'm a writer as well, so I really enjoy writing. And, um, you know, I enjoyed writing the the, the VO um, very much. But yes, it was, I would say, you know, at least 20 drafts, let's say, each, each section um, to get it just right. Also, you know, when we were, were recording, I was even editing during that process because you know when you actually you hear it you're like oh no i don't like that word or you know and then you have to do it again so it was constant yeah constant editing process throughout so tariki you're on <laughs> you're on screen so much you're the detective in this film <laughs> and you're doing all oh, no, the things i didn't want to be on screen said. at all right <laughs> so you can I relate that's, that's largely I can rely on, and I think largely, um, uh, like Celeste, I, I had to smile, Celeste, when you were talking about not liking the sound of you, because I, I hate hearing myself uh, in things. I mean, I've, I've always been that way, which when you're like me, and for a long time, I, I made my living out of performance was kind of weird and difficult, but I don't like, I, I balk at it for some reason. Do you, do, you, but, do you prefer hearing yourself sing to hearing yourself speak? Is that it? No, I'm not fond of either of them particularly. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't register the good bits. I only find that tiny little niggly thing that, that everyone else tells me they can't hear. Either they're all lying to me, or I'm the one that's wrong. Uh, I prefer to think that they're all lying to me. That there is that that thing that that, that grates on me. I don't know. Um, I don't know why, but I am on screen uh, a lot, and indeed there was. Um, there was more if there were if there was if there was one argument alec and i were going to have over and over again it was about pieces to camera and uh, recorded a lot of them thankfully they they didn't end up going into the into the film at the end but it's it's a really interesting process i think sort of being both within and without at the same time and our, our script went through oh, i couldn't think how many uh, how many iterations and uh, even right the, right through the height of of covid we were recording placeholder voiceover over um, over zoom and uh, and other 
which was which was really good because it gave an opportunity to to feel it in my body to to have a go at it until the end when we finally polished up what was a final version of the script i was able to do the whole voice over in a day once we finally got into the studio but it's a real it's still a very fraught and and difficult process and this again was another space where it was fantastic having a co-director to work with to the point where i could just say look take it take it away <laughs> and you do something with it come back and look at no i'm not, not saying that not saying that no but, uh but we were able to it, it was a very live writing process uh between alec and i and i think that was one of the more enjoyable parts for me actually was really getting into that nitty gritty. I love, I love the fine details. And in, in refining a script, that's where I can, I can quibble over that single word until the, the point where I'm happy with it and then have to go and do the recording and then find things I'm not happy about again. But you're on screen as well. You're on screen, you're on screen, you're on screen a little bit, which, and that was something you had to be convinced to do. Yeah. I'll look to, to a certain extent. Um, I don't know if it's just just me. I was I was I was concerned. I think to some extent of putting too much of myself physically myself in the in the thing. I mean, I'm I'm massive anyway. I'm six foot four. I'm I'm gigantic. I take up I take up screen space when I'm on there. But I think I was concerned about getting in the way of the story at times, and I probably needed to be talked down. And 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 those people who did talk me down were right that. I think it was important that I was there to tell that story, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit this now in in the confines of 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 this space. I've never said it publicly. I realise that's ironic. It's a public recording, but I think I was very concerned about getting in the way of the story, very much so that because I didn't want this to be about me. I was happy for it to be about my journey or the journey that I felt I was going on with other people, and hope taking people on that journey with us through the film. But that I wasn't trying to to pull that spotlight onto myself, or I wasn't trying to to say, "Well, look at me, look at look at what my grandfather does has done." Surely, I I get some kind of credit for that. And it was never there. But I think there's always that that fear, and certainly when we think when you, you really question about family and community as well, how that's been given away to other people. Certainly, with someone like my grandfather, who is such a such a feature of of the Victorian Aboriginal community, the idea of knowing that I still had have to live in this community once the film's done, once once the film is shown for the final time, and uh, once that that screen gets turned off, or once the once the film stops rolling in the theatre, at the same time. I go back to this life, and I imagine this very similar for for all of us here on this conversation. That we, you go back. That's the reality to which you return, and being very conscious of the type of legacy, if I can use that word, that I would be leaving in this film, and knowing that I struggled for a while about putting my daughter in in the film, albeit very. Briefly and fleetingly, but I thought it was, in many ways, it ended up being so important to me that there was this generational narrative moving through it as well. But knowing that what I do now, you should say for those she's going to have to answer for with, one day. Yes, and and the it film does. Yes, she's the opening shot of the film. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, she's just been born, and you're she's, you're reviving an aspect of your culture. Or her mm, wrapping her in her in her big anger, her possum skin cloak, which um, mm. which brings home to me just how long I've been making this film because she's six now, and I I didn't even have kids when I first started making this, so it's it's been a journey. I know there's three of them now. I don't know where that came from. Guys, it's been a real pleasure, but um, we've recorded um, a lot, and it's all been great, but um, we do have to wrap it up. So I want to thank you all again, um, and uh, I'll just have to uh, make sure I get all your names right. Uh, Christine Hamburg is the co-director of He's My Brother. Tariki Onis is the co-director of Ablaze, which, is, as I mentioned earlier, is a MIF Premier Fund-supported film.
and Celeste Bell is the co-director of Polystyrene. I am a cliche. Uh, and uh, I'm Jason DeRosso. You can hear me over at Radio National. My show there is called The Screen Show. And for more information about the Melbourne International Film Festival, uh, of course, you can uh, go and view the full program of films, talks and special events over at the website, which is myth.com.au. Hope you've enjoyed the panel uh, and I hope you enjoy a film, this myth. Thank you.